We had met two years prior. Oh. Randomly. Like, and didn't realize we were carrying this information into, his, into this relationship. We had met, he's, his high school band came and played in my hometown. No And way. no one plays in my hometown. And I happened to meet him there that night and didn't connect the dots until we like started hanging out. Like, those two like make up for it, you know? Yeah. They make me stronger because of it. And I think, I just, I appreciate those guys. I mean, I love them to death. They are absolutely my brothers and I'd do anything for them. Um, our biggest challenges, I think, were more so creatively. I think putting our three brains together and figuring out the best way to present all of our individual taste and ideas. And I don't think that that was a negative challenge. I think it was a positive challenge. I think it was something that we're still, you know, constantly trying to figure out. Hi, this is Lauren Engel. Today I'm here with Chase of Coin. Hi. <laughs> So were you born in West Virginia or? So I was born in West Virginia and um, yeah, I grew up, basically I lived there until I was like 18 and then I went to college in Belmont, in mm -hmm. Nashville, yeah. And growing up you're from like a huge line of like writers and musicians. <laughs> yeah, like my, my whole family, like when I go to a family reunion it's yeah. like everybody can play music. Yeah. But that's on my dad's side and um, my dad, I grew up. He wrote songs and produced albums, and he was also a pastor of a church. Mm. And I learned to play music at church, basically, yeah. when I was like, really young. You were also, were you in some church bands? I mean, kind of, yeah. yeah. To the extent, like, yeah, I helped him play at church, like at his church that he pastored. Mm. Was uh, religion a big part of your upbringing? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, my dad being a pastor, it was always like super important, and he's still a pastor of a church, so. Yeah, it was a really, it was honestly all of it. I didn't have friends really at school. They were all really at church, to be mm. honest. So it was a really a big part of it, yeah. honestly. What, what career was your mom in? Oh, no. So my mom worked at the church as well. Oh. Yeah, it was kind of like, she grew up, her dad was in the military and she traveled quite a bit. And she went to, she went to college and like pursued, she was gonna be an attorney. And then by the time that she was like gonna like pursue law school, my father um, became the pastor. And she decided, she didn't like decide to just drop everything, but she just started helping him and little by little, she just decided that she wanted to help transform this little community in West Virginia. And that's what became their, their, uh, their MO basically. Yeah. Other than Christian music, what kind of music were they playing in the house? In the house? Um, yeah. old country music. My mom loves, my mom doesn't really like music very much. Oh. Right here. Here. And, uh, but she loves this song, Time in a Bottle by Gr Jim Croce. <laughs> I can have time in a bottle, I don't even know. But yeah, she loves that song, only because of the concept. And that actually like, partially inspired the song Cemetery we wrote recently. Oh. Yeah, because she was like, she was like, you should write a song that means as much to me. Like, I was like, that, what, a, what a crazy thing to ask yeah. me to do. <laughs> but yeah, so it was, uh, it was beautiful though. But growing up, it wasn't a lot of music really. It was my dad playing music and writing music in the house. That was mm -hmm. a big part of it. How else would you describe your personality back then growing up? Uh, attention seeking, probably. I don't know if that's a way to, way to describe it, but I really wanted, I grew up very, this is crazy, I'm crazy, getting crazy vulnerable right now, but I grew up very <laughs> short. Like I was like short until like I was like in high school. Mm -hmm. And so I think I was always tried to overcompensate and speak louder mm -hmm. because, because of that. And um, you know, make up for it my personality. So I always wanted to be heard because I didn't feel like I was heard. Mm -hmm. um, I've settled in now a little bit more. <laughs> but have I though? Because I'm about to play like the loudest stage. <laughs> And did you know from the onset that you wanted to make music your career? No, it took, I'd say, I was probably about 12 when um, I wrote my, wrote my first song. I took <laughs> piano lessons for years, we've been Yeah. And, um, but I had to, I chose to come back to the piano when I was 12. And then I started learning, learning songs, learning how to use, use the, um, you know, use the instrument to make, to express myself. And um, I was probably 18 when I wrote, like, I had written songs, like silly songs before, but um, I was probably like 18 when I wrote my first song and discovered my, like, my singing voice, if that oh, makes sense. Wow. And then I, and then I moved <laughs> to Nashville to basically pursue songwriting, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, but I didn't really know I was going to be a musician until I joined this band, I don't think. Like, or like in a band, you know? If that makes sense. Yeah. So w were you showing like your early songs to your dad for feedback or singing to him for feedback? Yeah, but I think he was so far removed from the world that we were in. Mm. He's super talented, but 
he didn't always understand. I remember when I showed him, I can't even remember what it was. It was some like 2008 band, like MGMT or something like that. Yeah. And he just couldn't understand it. Not that he didn't appreciate it, but he was just like, what are all those little noises? Like, because like, <laughs> like, like, he was like, you know, a producer and thought that every part should have its place. And I just like wanted to make some, <laughs> make some noise, you know? Um, but in a way, it helped me because it made me, it, like I took what he taught me about music production and songwriting, which is like every part counts and every part matters. And I kind of like took what I learned from alternative music growing up and kind of transformed those things together. What did you study at Belmont? I studied songwriting. Oh. Which is crazy that's even a thing. Like yeah. That. But yeah, I studied songwriting. So both of you did both songwriting or? Joseph? Yeah. Joseph studied, um, well actually even crazier major, Joseph studied like commercial voice. I don't oh. know what he wanted to do with that. Like, I don't know what the plan, what the, what the big goal was, but it's beautiful. I think we met, and we met because that was the only class we had in common in our entire majors, and we could have taken it at any point in our majors, and we chose to take it at that exact time when we sat next to each other the first day. Did you click instantly, or how was it? So, no. I mean, looking at Joe at the time, I, where I'd grown up in church, and I wasn't staying with shelter, I traveled quite a bit, but I didn't, I, maybe I was used to a certain type of person, and Joe had a nose ring and had long hair, not being judgmental, but I just, I just didn't know what, I didn't know, I didn't know how to talk to somebody like that, like mm. a cool person, he was like the kind of guy who knew everybody, he had been there for a semester longer than I had at that point, so, and um, no, I just sat next to him, and after three weeks I worked up the nerve and said, I like want to write a song with you. What kind of music are you interested in? Mm -hmm. And um, well, actually, I turned to the guy beside me first, and he was like, "Yeah, maybe." And then, then Joe, I, t I was like, the next day, I turned to Joe and I was like, "Do you want to write a song?" And he said uh, he had not heard the rejection the day, the day before. <laughs> of the guy and he was like, "Yeah, sure," and told me what he was into. And so we went in my dorm room and sat down and played. We like finished this song. He had this weird conference call that day. <laughs> It was so bizarre. I was just sitting there, just alone. And I actually found the voice memos very recently oh. of, uh, of those for, uh, that first day. Oh, that's cool. Oh, my Blackberry, out of Blackberry. Oh, Blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> and we, bl I listened to him, and basically we wrote this acoustic-sounding, uh, I don't know, Anthony Green-esque, like emo revival acoustic kind of vibe. And I, I, it just, it didn't click. I'll be honest. And we, as he was walking up the door. I had just seen this band walk the moon for the first time. Oh. I saw them, I was, this was like five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. I had just seen them for the first time and there was when they just put out Anna Sun. And I loved, I just like loved the live energy of that show. And I was like, I want to do something like this someday. And I just explained to him, I had been writing these songs that kind of sounded similar to this like alternative synth 80s like new wave revival thing happening. And he said, and I played him what was one of the first songs in the EP and he was just like, yeah, sure. Like just like instantly, it was just like, whoa! You just committed to that like a little too quickly, <laughs> and we we set out the premise to play one show as a band, and and then one show led to another show, led to another show, and here we are. Yeah. What what else about his personality that you liked, or like <sighs> until now, to you? No, I. So to be honest, actually, this is actually deeper in the story. We had met two years prior. Oh. Randomly, like. And didn't realize we were carrying this information into his, into this relationship. We had met his his high school band came and played in my hometown, no and way. no one plays in my hometown. And I happened to meet him there that night, and didn't connect the dots until we like started hanging out. <laughs> and so that's when I realized when we started like pursuing this more. And maybe that's why he maybe he he was so quick to say yes because we had this, this established connection. We'd only talked for five minutes in my hometown, but no bands come to my hometown. When I realized that's who he was. It was too much for me to be to ignore this and say like this is like destiny is manifesting itself right now. There's something at, at work that we don't understand. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's crazy that we met up again, right? Yeah. That's insane. That's not the world's not that small. Mm -hmm. And do you remember who first came up with the name coin? <laughs> it, I mean, it was okay. Bizarrely enough, we actually this guy from my hometown. Everything's coming back to my hometown for some reason. <laughs> We met, uh, we met, I looked up to him so much, and his band was named, was called Greylag. And they're still, a, they're, I don't think they're still a band anymore. They were on like Sub Pop, and I just, he, he was like the other guy who, like the one guy who got out of my hometown and pursued music. Moved to Portland, was super cool. And I, his band was called Greylag, and I was like, how do you even come up with a band name like that? Where do you even come up with a word like that? Mm -hmm. And I searched Greylag, and I found out it was a horse's name. And being from, being from West Virginia, there's so much Kentucky Derby affiliation. So I started looking through antique store books, like 
online databases of like racehorse names. And I found one, I just kept looking, I was like looking to see if words were associated because I was on this, what would seem like never ending search for one more band name. And I found Lucky Coin mm. and, and I was like, Luck, like we're gonna call the band Luck, like that's, that's perfect. And uh, it was obviously taken. And, <laughs> and I searched Coin and somehow no one had attached themselves to the name of the project. And I told it to the guys, and because the band was starting such a carefree nature, like we didn't think we were gonna play more than one show. That, this was the whole point was to play a show, you know. And so they were like, "Yeah, sure." We never thought about it ever again. <laughs> and here we are. Actually, what's the realization or changes in that? Because initially it was so carefree, and right. all of a sudden it's like management, labels, and all that. You didn't expect for any of this. Right. I know. I didn't ask for this for sure. <laughs> Um, but I couldn't be more grateful that it happened, you know? Mm -hmm. I think, I, I don't want to say that one show led to another show and now we're here. I cannot tell you how real that is. We didn't, not that we didn't go and actively pursue things and work hard for things, but things just kept falling into our lap and it's not, and maybe that's why things have happened so gradually and so slowly for us. But um, I couldn't be happy with how it's turned out because I think that this, the way we're going to be able to sustain this growth and continue to grow it is just to do it, you know, systematically and slowly because you know, you don't want it to happen all at once because it's just a pendulum. As fast as you come in, it's as fast as you're going to go away. And um, so, I don't know. It's, it's exciting. It's Right now, it's specifically exciting because I can... You know, you have those moments when you look in the mirror and you realize you've grown up. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, you have this, like, who is this person? Yeah. Um, kind of... This tour has been a very reflective time for me to realize how much we've grown and how thankful we are for this, for this platform we've been given. Mm-hmm. And what does success look like to you guys? I don't know if I have an answer for that. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I want to say that I feel successful right now just in the way that I don't want to put um, a tangible thing attached to it. You know, like maybe some people would say like playing Madison Square Garden or like, you know, having, having a specific goal in mind, which is important to have goals and write things down and, and be, uh, you know, being specific. But I think that it's important for me to be right now, to be here and be thankful for what I have, otherwise I'll be too caught up in continuing to look at the next step and, and lose track of what's literally right in front of me right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that said, if we can continue what we're doing and just raise the number of people, like, I mean, it's, it's amazing because we haven't tried to do this, you know, we've just been playing shows and people have just naturally, almost magnetically been drawn to what we're doing. And um, it's taken a long time, of course, but, yeah, if we can just keep doing that over and over and over, then I'm so thrilled because we've created this community and this family for people and a sense of belonging to a lot of people. Maybe not everyone that comes to our shows. Some people just come because they heard a song on the radio, you know, but there's a lot of people in the crowd that really feel like we feel. We feel like this place is almost a home for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really special. And that's maybe that's what successful looks like to Yeah. Me. Last question. How do you feel like you've grown as a person compared to when you were younger? I don't speak as much. Mm. Yeah, I think that's, and I learned within the past year that the more you talk, the less people will remember. And I say this after talking straight for 15 <laughs> minutes, but you know, it's an interview. <laughs> but I try, even my, my phone background, I don't have it with me. It says stop talking. <laughs> and it's not, you know, not to shut me up, but mm -hmm. it's just for me to keep in mind, to choose my words and really think about what I'm trying to say and say it the most clearly. Um, so maybe maybe that's how I've changed the most. But, you know, I, I've gathered a lot of information along the way about writing songs and about how crowds behave and how people behave. And, uh, but I, it's funny though, because I look in the mirror and I like see the same person, even though, I, you know, obviously grown up, but I, recently we went back to my dorm room in Nashville where we met where we like first joined all together. Oh yeah, you filmed that. Yeah. I, the, I love that. I love and those I just videos. like walked, I walked in and started talking to it and I started, I started talking about the experience and I just started crying because I realized mm -hmm. how much I had my life figured out six years ago, you know? Mm -hmm. I didn't, I had it almost more figured out then than I did, than I do now. Mm -hmm. I think I, I used to get caught up in so much and and managers, labels, and things. And maybe I know a lot more about the business and about songwriting, about the craft of it, and maybe how it's made, but it's funny because I think I understood why I wanted to do it more then, and I'm trying to get, I'm still working to get back there. So maybe I haven't grown 
as much as I thought I had. <laughs> oh, I love this so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's so kind of you. This is oh. wonderful. Thank you. What a great conversation. Hi. And now I'm with Ryan of Coin. <laughs> so where were you born originally? I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And all of your families there? Yes, it's just my parents and I. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're still in Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of careers are they in or when you were growing up? Um, my father is a uh, painter. He paints buildings. Oh wow. And um, not artistically, but he, he's a, a working man and paints mm -hmm. buildings. And uh, my mother was a decorator for many years and she sold men's suits and she had a lot of fun jobs throughout her life. So you got your creative sides from both of them, I guess. Yeah, I think so. I think a little bit from both. What kind of music were they playing in the house when you were growing up? Um, my mom would play, she really liked a lot of soft vocal performance stuff like mm -hmm. Sade and like Seal um, and like Celine Dion and kind of like that was kind of her vibe and then my dad listened to a lot of rock music and a lot of 80s new wave. His favorite band is U2 but mm. was also into like Depeche Mode and The Cure, uh, New Order, a lot of that stuff so I feel like I grabbed a little bit from each of them. Mm -hmm. How so. would you describe yourself back then growing up? Me? Yeah, like in high school or something. Um, I was always playing music, so, uh, so I guess I started playing when I was about 12 years old, but before that I played a lot of sports. Um, and I was an only child, so I was always forced to kind of be creative with my time and my, you know, my space at home. And I never felt lonely. I had a lot of friends with older brothers and stuff like that, so I was very social. Mm -hmm. Did you realize from the onset that you wanted to make music your career? When my father started taking me to concerts, that's when I decided that um, it's what I wanted to do because I remember watching a drummer on stage and I remember feeling the way the drums felt because it was very loud mm -hmm. um, at the venue I went to and that was the most attractive piece of the sort of musical puzzle to me so I decided that's something I want to do so we started going to like the musical instrument store almost every week and my dad would let me just like bash away and <laughs> thank God the guys at the store were really nice and they, they remembered me from the times you know before that I'd showed up and uh, <laughs> played the drums but I think uh, you know a few Christmases later I ended up getting a drum set and started playing so. How many bands were you in before Coin? I was in a bunch of bands in high school. Uh, I used to play metal music which was really fun um, and technical and kind of just gave me like a lot of uh, outlet I suppose for my teenage angst <laughs> so that was a lot of fun so yeah I, I played in like three or four bands and still keep in touch with all the guys that I used to play music with mm -hmm. which is really cool so and what were you guys studying at Belmont I actually didn't go to Belmont oh okay yeah so Joe and Chase did um, I just moved to Nashville to continue playing music um, I suppose with the hope that I'd meet some you know some other people that were like-minded and uh, about a year into living in Nashville, I met Joan Chase. Oh, so. how did you decide on Nashville then, initially? Um, I had a friend who was working uh, as a tour manager or tour manager assistant for a country artist, and he was from Cleveland, and he had just gotten this job. So he uh, notified my friend and I that he'd be moving, and he knew that we were interested in moving as well to continue, you know, trying to further our music careers individually. And uh, he offered for us to live in this apartment that he had just secured, so the three of us then you know packed up and moved there so it was kind of on a whim because I didn't really know much about Nashville but I knew that there was music there so mm -hmm. what clicked to you to form a trio you know I don't know I don't know exactly what what, what made us uh, start the band as, as much as it was just getting in a room and playing I don't know that anyone realized it was going to be a band. I think we just started playing the music together and something felt really good and really natural. And I think when that happens, you, you just want to jump on it. So we crammed our stuff into Chase's dorm room and then continued playing together almost every day um, when the guys were done with classes or when I was done working at a coffee shop, you know, so. What was the turning point that you wanted to have a name and be a band? Um, I think when we played our first show, cause Chase had never played a show before. And uh, Joe and I had been in bands in high school and stuff like that and kind of knew the feeling. Um, but we wanted to expound upon it and, and see if we could make it, you know, something cool. So we took these four songs that we wrote in Chase's dorm room and we basically took them to this magazine launch party in Nashville and we played. Uh, they needed one more band, so I had been working on something with someone at the magazine that earlier that week and I heard them saying, hey, we really need a band to play. And we'd been a band for like 20 minutes, so I was like, you know what, sure, you know, our band can play. We're called Coin, like we had just sort of figured out the name situation as well. And uh, we were eager, so then we, we started the band from there. I think mm -hmm. it just took that, that first show to really, 
you know, decide we're gonna do this, mm -hmm. so. And was it also one of your early shows that you played at some basketball courts? <laughs> no, so, so we joke about that first show <laughs> because it was kind of in this like boomy warehouse space yeah. uh, where the magazine had their offices. And to us, it sounded like a basketball gym. Oh. Like if you'd ever heard people play music in a basketball gym, that's what it sounded like. So that's why we joke about that. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to play in a basketball gym now, though. <laughs> no. If we could go back, that'd be, that'd be great. And how do you think um, you got your first momentum initially? So literally, I, I know this sounds silly, but one show led to another. Mm -hmm. um, so basically that first show, there was a guy there that said, hey, I need another opening band for this gig at like this club in Nashville um, that was called 12th and Porter. And I, I think it might still be there. But anyways, we said yes. And we basically said yes to everything for like six months. Oh, wow. And we were playing almost every weekend, but not so much so that people were hopefully not getting sick of us. But um, yeah, so we just we played one show at a time and then we eventually met our manager and our attorney because we released a music video on the internet um so that was the, that was really the turning point where we we're like okay cool we we have a team around us but at first the momentum started with just playing shows in nashville and trying to get anyone to care like i would invite people you know to the shows um that, that came into the coffee shop every morning joe and chase would you know hound people at school and be like hey man come to my show whatever i feel like that's you just have to go out there and, and ask people to come and decide uh I guess they get to decide if they like it or not, you mm -hmm. know? And is that their same management as now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Our manager, Will, has been with oh, us wow. since the beginning, so we're super grateful for him, and he does a lot for us. So. How did you realize it was a good fit initially? Uh, he literally came down to see us in Nashville, you know, probably like a week after he emailed us. He said, hey, I'm going to come down. I, re I see you guys have a show, which is really funny because Joseph, our guitar player, actually did not play that show because he was in South Africa working on some, some music. Uh, he was doing a trip there. So we ended up playing this show and like essentially showcasing for our current manager without, you know, of course, one of the most important parts of our band, which is Joe. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of strange, but eventually we got to meet and um, he just was very, very genuine. And you, you, of course, in Nashville have a lot of people barking at you if there's any momentum going on. But we didn't really have that. We had a lot of people that were super supportive and encouraged us to take things super slowly. Mm. So when we met Will, we were like, you know what, this timing feels right. We're not rushing into you know anything with anybody. So yeah, we're super thankful for him. How do you think um, Talk Too Much got the garner the attention? Oh, interesting. Um, I think Talk Too Much was a song that was very instant for a lot of its first time listeners and I think the hardest part is to get people to listen again mm -hmm. so I think with any sort of you know pop oriented song it's easy to be excited about it the first time it's really hard to then listen to that song hundreds of times and decide that it's you know your favorite song or whatever or especially with a band decide that you really actually like that band so Talk Too Much was one of those songs that I know um, Joe and Chase when they first started working on it were a little uncertain about because it was so upbeat and felt a little different from our older music um, but it turned out to just be a great success because we all kind of put our heads together um, on how to present it to the live audience, which eventually became the most energetic and mm. monumental part of our show. So I'm, I think that it's a mixture of just taking a risk creatively um, in the studio and then figuring out the best way to deliver it live and, and hope that people like it, you know, when they come to the show. Mm -hmm. How were you also pushing it online? Or was it mostly just through the shows? Well, I think it was both. I mean, we, we had a lot of radio support uh, at the time. Um, our label, Columbia, is awesome, and we had a lot of label support and radio support at the same time. So um, they were good about, you know, spreading the word, and then we were basically on tour at the time. So I think it's just like a perfect storm. And you can never plan for something like that. So as much as people are working on the song or working on, you know, trajectory and hoping for the best, you really just have to show up and play. And, and see if people like it. People decide, you know, when, when songs become big, it's, it's really just people making that decision to continue listening, so. Mm -hmm. And what is it like going from initially like self-managing and booking all these whatever shows you want to like having a label, like a management, and sure. like probably telling you no to a lot of things? It makes you, it makes you actually work a lot harder. Mm. Um, you work very hard in the beginning when you have nothing, and then when you realize that no one's gonna care as much as you do, you work even harder. Um, and that's not to say that no one we work with cares. Everyone we work with is, is phenomenal, but it just means that when you have that team, you view it as resources and you view these people as your, you know, your friends and they become your family. And it just sort of develops to where everyone is focused on one thing. 
So I would say the grassroots thing was amazing for us and then having a, a supportive team was even better because they encouraged us and we encouraged ourselves, hey, we really need to work super hard if we want this. Because I think a lot of people will sign a record deal and think that everything's just gonna fall out of the sky. And I think when we were like, you know, 15, 16, and we wanted to play music for a living or whatever, we might have thought that was the case, but then you get into the role and you realize, oh my gosh, I really have to punch, you know, punch the gas even harder. So what would you say have been your biggest challenges so far as COIN? Um, our biggest challenges, I think, were more so creatively. I think putting our three brains together and figuring out the best way to present all of our individual tastes and ideas. And I don't think that that was a negative challenge. I think it was a positive challenge. I think it was something that we're still, you know, constantly trying to figure out. So I would say one of our biggest challenges was like falling into the sound that we have now, which is really scratching the surface of all of our sort of interests in music because they're always changing and you know none of us have a specific idea anymore of what coins should be mm -hmm. and i think when we started the band we might have um so we've tried to abandon that and just create from a super honest place and, and deliver the best music possible mm -hmm. and did you have or still have inspirations for your branding from the social media to the music videos i feel like it's super yeah. cohesive thank you so much absolutely i think that um on this record specifically this third album that's coming up I uh, can't tell you the title yet, but mm -hmm. it'll be soon. Um, it was very much about the tactility of things, the way things feel, the way things look, you know, almost as if you could pick them up because we've just felt very personal uh, in the songwriting process on this record as we've all been writing this music together. So being able to touch everything for the first time, the three of us just in a room, um, and you know, even in our bedrooms remotely as well, because we don't live in the same city anymore, really brought us to this idea of tactility and physicality. So I feel like the branding just reflects that. It's like a lot of objects and things that you can pick up and, and you can imagine like, you know, putting in your bedroom or something. So things that have been left behind that are mm. then going to be found. Um, I think that was kind of the concept. So we're always drawing inspiration, but specifically on this album, that's kind of, that was the outlook. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Last question, what does love mean to COIN? I would say for COIN, love is unity. And love is like realizing that we show up in a space every night on tour and we hope, you know, to meet new people, but we also see a lot of the same faces. And those same faces bring back different friends or family or whatever each time we come back to their city. Mm -hmm. So I think love is unity. I think love is like bringing these people together and clearly removing ourselves, removing any ego or any idea of what being in a band should be or should look like, and just acknowledging that when you get on a stage, everyone else is on the stage with you. Mm. You're doing the exact same thing. There's no platform for like the star and then there's no idea of like a fan. It's like what Coin's doing is supposed to be a family and getting all these people in one space is just an opportunity to unify them. Yeah. And, and we're all very close to each other. Yeah, so. I love that. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hi, now I'm with Joe. Hey, what's up? How you doing? <laughs> really good. So where were you originally born? I was originally born in Baltimore, Maryland. Mm. Yeah. Baltimore, and all of your England. family is there? Or? Yeah, yeah. For, the most, for the most part, yeah. I have a little family in North Carolina as well, but mainly... Actually, out here as well, but mainly, oh. mainly Maryland, mm -hmm. yeah. And what careers are your parents in when you were growing up? Uh, my mother is an interior designer, and my oh. father is a uh, an architect. He's owned a he's owned a, like a contracting company for about thirty years. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And so I guess you got your creative side from both of them, then. Mainly my mom's side of the family. Yeah. My grandfather, <laughs> my my great grandfather, and my grandfather would sing all the time. Oh grand, wow! And my one of my favorite parts about all of our. Uh, all the holidays is my my mom and her mom would be in the kitchen like singing, harmonizing oh, together. Oh, I stuff. love that! <laughs> it's so cute. What kind of music were they playing around the house? So supposedly, the first the first two bands that I ever heard when I came out of my mother's womb was Elvis and Bob Marley. Bob oh. Marley, I don't know why, but yeah. And at what age did you start getting into like classic rock really early? Right. That was yeah. yeah. That's like what I grew up on. My father. My father listened to a lot of classic rock, collect a lot of albums. Uh, his favorite band was The Cars. That's like basically my favorite band. I have like all their vinyl, like mm -hmm. double copies. <laughs> like a huge fan of the band. And then, like when you started out doing instruments, was that something that you requested for, or did your parents kind of decide for you? No, I kind of requested for it. Yeah. 
I started just kind of like on my own and like when I started I kind of like I kind of I picked up guitar I sang a lot like I, when I was a little kid I'd just like hum and sing around the house and then I picked up guitar with guitar lessons and I kind of just like became somewhat of a recluse mm. and like kind of just went in my room and just play guitar all yeah. the time and then uh uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it was kind of. It was yeah. on my own. It was on my own accord. I mean, my parents don't really. Yeah, my dad is, definitely cannot <laughs> sing to save his life, and my mom is lovely at it. She has a lovely mm -hmm. voice, but like no, no like crazy musicians in my family really. So mm -hmm. it was kind of. Yeah. I don't and know. what age were you in your first band form? <laughs> oh boy, uh, I was. Uh, I was fifteen. Oh, yeah. Like, but they were like high school friends. Yeah. yeah, well, they were actually all a little older than me. I was the youngest, and then the the guitar player, I was the singer. Mm -hmm. And the guitar player, uh, he was like 21, and uh, he moved in with me, and like we like shared a room together at my parents' house. It was really interesting, but yeah, I was like 15. Mm -hmm. How would how else would you describe your personality back then, growing up? Like back then? Yeah. Oh lord, uh, loose cannon, <laughs> an idiot. I don't know. I was I was a goofball. Mm -hmm. I did I did a lot of stupid things, but I've I've learned a lot of lessons and grown and matured since then. But yeah, I was just I was very go with the flow. Did do you, do yeah. whatever. Yeah. Did you realize you you would make music your career from the onset? I really didn't. I really didn't. Uh, uh, know that it was going to be my career until my guitar teacher in high school told me that I could make it something and that's oh, when wow. I moved, he like is basically the reason why I moved to Nashville which then after moving to Nashville I, I met Chase mm -hmm. and then uh, we met Ryan and formed Coin. so mm -hmm. yeah 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 so yeah I didn't really know I was gonna I didn't know what was gonna happen I was just again just kind of going with the flow and just doing what I uh, felt I was being called to do, mm -hmm. you know? So we'll skip ahead now, but okay, what cool. made you decide to sign with Columbia? Um, so we were all, at, uh, Chase and I were in school. Uh, Ryan just moved to Nashville, not, not to do school, just to pursue a music career. Mm -hmm. um, and I was about a year in uh, when we signed to management and they took us up to New York City to um, attend this festival called CMJ mm -hmm. um, and during that that festival we played a few shows and uh, some some label people came out um, and saw us play and that's when we we met Isaac Green during that week and uh, he had us into his office and we talked for a while and decided to sign to Columbia Records and then I dropped out of school and didn't look back. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and how did the touring with uh, 1975 happen? That happened just through like agents and uh, Paradigm, which is the agency that we work with. Mm -hmm. um, had some connections th through them and we were fortunate enough to play a few shows with them, yeah. which was super awesome. Yeah, great, was, great people. Yeah. What was it like working with Foster the People? <laughs> Mark? Yeah. So we worked with Mark and Isom. Uh, and they, I mean, we, the first day we worked with Isom. Actually, um, how did you meet them? How did we meet yeah. them? Um, so we just got, so they are signed to our, we have the same A&R. Oh, okay. They're signed to Columbia. Isaac Green is their A&R. Mm -hmm. And Isaac Green is also our A&R. And I think for a long time we were just, uh, I mean, I think maybe there, it was, it would have happened eventually to like kind of link up with them and uh, collaborate together. Um, and I think this was just the right time for it. Mm -hmm. And we, we met up with Isom at his apartment here in Los Angeles. Um, and we wrote some stuff together for a few days. And then uh, and then after that, we actually linked up with Mark and Isom and Isom and uh, kind of finished everything together and co-produced some stuff together. And yeah, nice. really, really, really fantastic people. Like mm -hmm. truly amazing. Um, yeah, yeah, really, really a pleasure working with them. What are your inspirations for your third album? Inspirations, like in what in what sense? Uh, could Just be in, like in lyrics, themes, or the style. Yeah. Um, I think, um, we're talking about it this morning actually. I think that this album um, is very 
we, we've been we've been saying this, telling this to a lot of people. If this album could be our self-titled album, it would be. Oh wow! I feel like we have grown into like who we actually are as people. We've discovered ourselves. We've matured as musicians, and I think that um, this this album is a little less ambiguous, and it's definitely more so like our diary for the past two and a half years, like mm -hmm. what we've experienced. Um, I think in the past. Um, either Chase or I or Ryan have had maybe a, maybe a difficult time or maybe un maybe we felt uncomfortable like sharing our true feelings with people mm -hmm. and I think that at least as far as I'm concerned like you know I, I think we've become more comfortable with, our, with ourselves and I think that um, we don't want to like lie to anybody or cheat anybody mm -hmm. out of anything like we want to be real with people and I think that is if you're if you're reaching out to so many people, like, why would you ever like create a fake song or yeah. I don't know, like, be real and, and and share your emotion and hopefully that can help other people in the long run. And I feel like that's what this third album is. Yeah. Um, it's just a diary of the past two and a half, three years for all of us. It's the most real thing we've ever created. Um, a lot of the parts are very like. A lot of the lyrics, melodies, and like musical parts, they're very intentional. Like we didn't really record this album with like in like legitimate studios or with like producers. We did it like as we were feeling it, like right there and then, like right then and then, like in our rooms, and like oh, she's very. It's yeah. like extremely personal, and like this album is extremely close to us. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Maybe we'll just cross Romance, it uncertainty. <laughs> uh, the list goes on, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is something that I always asks like, duos or trios, but what drew you to Chase and Ryan's personality, or what do you like about their personalities? Man, you know, um, I'd say that all three of us individually are so different. Mm -hmm. um, and there's... There's such a beauty in that. I think that once you, once you get past the differences and stuff, like you realize that, like, just like in a relationship, like that other person completes you. So in areas where I am, where I lack and I'm weak, like those mm -hmm. two, like, make up for it. You know, yeah. they make me stronger because of it. And I think I just I appreciate those guys. I mean, I love them to death. They are absolutely my brothers, and I do anything for them. And I I love where our friendship is and I love how we've been able to collaborate together in business form and in friendship form and in vulnerability and like the whole nine yards, you mm -hmm. know? I just love them. I love them <laughs> to death. Yeah. Actually going along with that, how do you think you've grown as a trio compared to when you first started? Yeah. Um, uh, I think as far as like, per, like personality wise, I feel as if we've just learned so much. Uh, we have like grown into ourselves, we're more mature. We understand, we understand our buttons. Like mm -hmm. we know what buttons not to push and what to push. Yeah. Um, and um, we really understand how to navigate around each other and how to lift each other up when we need it. And you know, how to correct each other when we need it in the best way possible. Not mm -hmm. in like a, not trying to tear each other down or anything, just always trying to make each other better and push each other forward. Um, as far as creativity, creatively, mm -hmm. did I say that right? <laughs> uh, as far as uh, creatively and co on a collaborative level, um, I think that we have really learned, again, it's like a, a strength and weakness thing. Like we've really learned what each other is, are good at and mm -hmm. like what we can contribute. And there is no, it's funny because sometimes when there when there are multiple people, let's say making a song or something, there's there's there are so many possibilities for ego to get in the way. Yeah. And and it, it's not that doesn't make you a bad person. It's just you're human. You know, the ego gets in the way. All, you know, sometimes. But it, it's really great when you can kind of like respect the people around you, aka Ryan and Chase, um, and know what they bring to the table and kind of let each other and bounce off of each other with that, like. That is that is a that is like the best collaborative thing you could do is just like play to each other's strengths and weaknesses, you mm -hmm. know, and come up with what what you can. Yeah. Like try to make the best thing, you yeah. know, and just keep going. It's I'm, fun that way. Yeah. You know. Last question: What do you want Coin to be remembered for? <laughs> um, 
Man, I, I, would, I want coin to be remembered for a lot of things. One, I want them to be, I want us to be remembered for like the, I want people to know that we're genuine. I want people to know that like, we're doing this for a greater, like greater good. We're not just doing this for ourselves. Like we, we, I, I have seen so many people cultivate relationships and friendships within just the, the community of a coin show or in the coin world. Um, I think that's, like one of the most beautiful things ever is like I hear all the time like people are like yeah we're best friends now and we met at a no. coin show and like oh, you did this that. it's like I don't really think that I did this because yeah. you guys <laughs> met each other but like that is so cool to mm -hmm. uh, to know that people have like created like lifestyles with each other's communities with each other's friendships relationships love romance whatever all of these things under the house of coin and that's that's really amazing. I, I, um, I, I want I want people to know that it's a. I want I want to be known as the band, uh, like where, that that creates an environment of safety for people. Mm. Like you can just walk into the Wiltern tonight and feel safe and not feel judged and not feel like overlooked. Like you feel like you belong and like no one's looking at you in a weird way or judging you. Like you can just be yourself. Uh, be yourself. Uh, <laughs> no, but I love so that. So cheesy, but no, I like yeah. genuinely mean that. Mm -hmm. Because like, yeah, maybe you're looking at us up on a stage and stuff and, and like thinking whatever, you know, you think about us. But like at the end of the day, like we're the same as everyone in that room, you know? And we're making ourselves look goofy up there dancing around. <laughs> like we're just trying to be ourselves. It's not mm -hmm. like we're trying to act cool or anything. And I think that I just, we, we try as hard as we can to cultivate like a community of people that are just like feel safe in our in our environment that we're creating mm -hmm. and, like i just want to be known for that yeah yeah i yeah. love this thank you so much yeah absolutely <laughs> thank you for hanging <laughs> asking questions